Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session where um, we talk about leveraging record and playback for mobile games and XR by Naomi Ferreira. So welcome. We are glad that you can join us today, Naomi. Hi. I'm glad to be here. So without further delay, over to you, Naomi. Um, it's all yours. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation. Just to add up to this one that um, maybe you know me online as the best links and I put there my Twitter account and my uh, blog as well. The blog is a little bit frozen now, but it's for a good reason. I'm writing a book, so my energy is going there, um, but it will be back and it already has a lot of good content that you may uh, want to check after this presentation as well to maybe add up to the concept that we're talking about here. And as Rohi said, uh, we're talking about leveraging record and playback for mobile games and XR. And this is going to be the agenda that we have for today. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages on uh, record and playback tools. So why are they good for and why are they not so good for and how can we make the best of them? Then we're going to talk about uh, the air test project, which is one record and playback tool. This, all the concept in this uh, talk can be applied to different playback and recording tools. This is just an example that is dearest to me because I've used it before and I work on them. Um, then we're gonna see how to enhance page object model. Most of you will be familiar with it. So we'll talk about it as well. We can talk also after that about how can we deal with the screenshots in a maintainable way. Record and playback tools sometimes uh, use the advantages of the screenshots and well, how can we deal with all of that? So the code is still maintainable. How can we deal with different resolutions and multiple object finders? Sometimes when we're dealing with uh, websites or uh, in this case, the uh, phones as well, we have different objects to find uh, different locators to find the objects. So how can we deal with those? Then we will talk about dealing with uh, multiple platforms. So Android and iOS is gonna be our example and how to deal with multiple devices. So when you have more than one device and this is very handy, for example, when you have uh, apps like games that may have to have two players and have to communicate with each other. Then we talk about XR. XR is sort of a mixture between VR and AR and multiple other things. So artificial intelligence, artificial reality, virtual reality, and other realities, they all combining cross reality, which is XR. So we're going to talk a little bit about it and how can we still do maintainable automation with it. Then we're going to talk about applications and conclusions. And finally, we're going to have some time for some questions. So it's going to be 11 uh, total of um, points and hopefully you'll enjoy it through uh, all the way through. Okay, so let's get started. So record and playback tools, what are the advantages? So we generate the code faster than if we were to write it manually because we just go and click around and then we get the result, right? Then that means that also someone with mixed skills and may not know about programming can still create these tests. Right, that can be repeatable, it can be redrun. We avoid writing repetitive and boring codes. Sometimes when we're writing automation, some of the parts are very repetitive and boring and we end up copying and pasting a lot. So we avoid all of that with a record tool because the recording tool is doing that for us. The code is still being repetitive, but we don't have to write it. And we have other ways of finding objects than done. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, DOM is document object model. It's an API uh, for, valid H uh, for validate HTML and well-formed XML documents um, to define a structure of the document and how the objects in the documents are accessed and, and manipulated. So this is what we use to find uh, locators and find the elements when we are dealing with our automations. And then finally, uh, it could work for different applications such as XR. It has functionality for XR, for games, and for other difficult to test applications. But what are the disadvantages? If it has so many advantages, why not everyone is using it, right? Well, it has low maintainability. Once you record something, it's really hard to add something into that or remove something from there. It also has low reliability. It means that uh, for example, especially when the UI is changing frequently, 
we're gonna have to go and record the whole thing again if we want to get or the best for for the the thing to work. Otherwise, it's going to fail because the UI has changed. Maybe the icons don't look the same, and it will break the best. It has low scalability as well. So if I want to scale it and to use more um, devices, to use more type of testing, all of that is usually very difficult to do with this sort of tools. Uh, because of this, it's also harder to reproduce in other platforms. So if you have some code that is working for a platform and now you have to do it the same, basically the same sort of steps and tests in another platform to generate that code. It has a low reducibility for the same reason. You need to also record again for another test that is basically very similar. For example, if you have the most common one, you have a login and then you do something else. Then if you have to record another test for the other test, you also have to record again the login and do something else. So these sort of things is what make um, the record and playback tool not so popular. And also it causes a lot of test abuse, especially when you're dealing with the screenshots, which is one of the benefits of, of the tool that I'm presenting today. And this is because all the screenshots that you take, they are left over there. And they, unless you keep a good maintainer of, maintainable of this, and, and you go in and remove the, the screenshots that were there before, there's going to be some test abuse. And also for the, even for the test, if you create another test, your old test is going to be somewhere in your computer. You have to re remember to re delete it. And that's kind of an extra, um, an extra step on it. So what is our test project? Our test project is the samples that I'm, that I'm going to give uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, and the Ertest project uh, cons uh, consists in two, thi in two things, the POCO, which is the backend, and the IDE, which is kind of the front end, right? It's just an example. Again, I don't want to go deeper into it, but just so you understand how it looks and just for, for us to have a working example of everything that we are talking about, all the concepts that we're talking about, here is how it will look. So we have here, um, let me just get the laser pointer yeah so we have connected to our, our mobile device here and we can see it here on the right hand side of the screen and then in here we have all the um, capabilities for uh, screenshots um, automation in here we have the capabilities for many different applications so here we can see the DOM of android of ios i just created a new file and here is for uh, Selenium, if you want to, to automate in Selenium. So I just click here, record button, and then I can just go on my mobile phone and I can do things here and it will be recording here. And it will record all of these um, different steps, swipe, touch, it, it may be a little bit small, so I hope you can see it well. Um, but also I have some examples later on with the code in the slides. So you're gonna see it bigger. So we can see here, I can click around and I can play with my game. This game is called um, Dancing, Dancing Lines 2, uh, in case someone wants to install it. And basically you have to click at the time of the song. So when the song is kind of telling you, there's also a visual uh, cue, you can have to click it to, to pass the level. It's pretty much fun, I really like it. Um, it has a little bit of adver advertisement, but what can you do? Yes, <laughs> it's normal. Okay, so we've seen how it works. So let's see, let's go to see how to enhance the page object model. So I'm pretty sure most of you know what page object model is. It looks something like this for those who don't know. And basically we have a uh, amount of uh, some classes that are gonna be our model where we have our test case logic, right? So for each different maybe features, we will have uh, test cases related to that one. And on the other side, we have some classes that, in, um, that are called from the model that are called pages in which we have our page elements definition. So what's a page? So a page can be a view, it could be a URL endpoint, and for some apps, maybe not so clear, like for example, for, for games. Uh, so it could also be forms, it could also be a window, it could also be a screen, or for game, it could be a level. So what our page is, is like depending on the app, right? And um, the idea is to have together the similar type of locator. So uh, then uh, we can 
they are all located in one site and we can easily change it if something needs to be changed rather than having to go through the code of test cases and figure out where all of the location locator is being called and having to change it one by one and trying to like figure it out in a very long uh, base code. So we separate it and it, we keep everything cleaner. So how can we enhance this uh, to also allow us to do things like record and playback and screenshots? So basically we will have a, um, a folder where we keep our screenshots and our page is gonna call the screenshots and we're gonna be able to retrieve the elements there and everything else is gonna be the same. So very, very similar to what we have before. Our model is gonna be uh, .r because um, we're using air test, but it's not uh, so important, right? It's just so you know that if you see that, that is because of that. So we're gonna have a folder for pages. I call it like this, you can call it anything. And then we're gonna have our folder that is .r, that is gonna be for our model. In the case of air test, we're gonna see the .r, otherwise we don't need it. Okay, so how the pages will look. This is very easy code that I'm doing here with Python, so I hope everyone can follow up. Uh, basically, for this, I'm also using drivers find element by ID, which is very similar to a website rather than Android or iOS. We will see later on how to do it for them. But just so you are kind of familiar with the code, probably because page object model are usually explained for websites. So just to follow on that. So I have some a list of elements, and then I have some meta like this one, click a button, and then I will use air to touch in this case to, to get the element. And the model, how it will look. So the model looks something like this. I have to import the API for air test to do the stuff that I want to do with the touch, with the um, Android uh, and iOS uh, related uh, routines. And I'm importing the page um, from the, so the page file name is the name that I have in this case, it will be uh, whatever I have inside of here. And the home page class is the name of the class. We'll see it in an example in a little bit, so don't get too lost. Then we get the URL, and then we just instantiate that class from that we imported, and we click on the bottom. So basically, we have separated what is our pages and what is our uh, model. We have an extra thing. It's always the same, so you can just like, copy and paste this, except for this bit here. You can also use append instead of insert. And this bit here that I'm, what I'm doing here is um, basically telling my air test um, .r that my path is going to contain the other folder. So they, uh, they code understand that where everything is and how to import everything. So this is just so to make it work with the two, um, with the two uh, folders. Okay, so how can we um, handle the screenshots, right? So we will see we, we see it in the example before that, well, we have uh, a screenshot, but that screenshot can turn into code. And when we turn that screenshot into code, it looks like this. There's a template, there's an R here, and then the all the screenshots that are taken with AirTex are going to start with TPL, then some IDs, and then PNG, right? So this is how it's usually called, but obviously you can rename it and then rename it here. Then there's a record position that is not so important. And then there's a resolution. This one is important because if we have different resolutions, we can have a screenshot with the same IDs and the different resolutions, or we can have maybe a different screenshot together, a different name, different record position. But the resolution is very important because especially when we're dealing with games, where we're dealing with um, automation that is on the mobile phones. The mobile phones have different resolution one from another. So this is important. And then we have, uh, again, the click button, same as before. So this is how the screenshot will look when we define it as an element. Let's see all of this that we've been talking about. Let's see that in an actual example with our test. Um, so in this example, so this is the, the code that we have before, right? So we generated these screenshots from before, 
And what we're going to do is right click and we're going to click on uh, image render uh, code and that is going to produce our code. And this is how it looks now. So it just replaces all the actual images for a template. And what we're going to do next is I have created another folder there. We're going to take the screenshot from the folder that is being auto generated. And we're going to copy it into the folder. We're going to cut it into the folder that we've created. So if you can see here, these are the auto generated screenshot. So this one is the first one here. And then the second one, and so on and so forth. I don't need so many screenshots. These were just for an example, so I took too many of them. So you will see that reduced later on. So I go to my page and I copy here all the screenshots. And in here I have a Python file, which I also created with AirTest, but just a simple Python file. And I'm going to do the same for the Python file. I'm going to get all the screenshots and I'm going to paste it here. And I know this looks super manual. And I'm say I'm telling you that this is to enhance the model and so it can be automated, but all of these steps can also be automated. I'm just showing it so you understand the process that is being followed to make it from a single page into a page of jet model with all the screenshots and everything inside. So now I create uh, some methods in my page. So I, I create a class as I've been seen in the code before. I initialize it and maybe I start creating an um, object like this one. So I literally just took the template from my, my method and then I just copy the method here and I change it for the object that I instantiated. So we can say we will do the same for the other objects. For example, we can create one for the piano. And when we do that, and we replace for all of that, again, looks very manual, but can be automated. And uh, then we need to remove it from our air test to move all the objects from there because they have been generated on the wrong file, basically. And we're going to add the uh, piece of code that I showed before. So the code to call the folder and also the code to call the, the class. OK, so this code is a little bit wrong. So we're going to see it on the, on the next slide. We're going to see how it, everything looks finally. So this is how, how it will look in the end. And if he wants to start the video, there we go. And so I have my elements defined. So I reduce it to six elements there. And I have my methods where I wait for the element and then I click it. So I don't go and, you know, maybe my, my tests are not so flaggy because I'm going to wait for the element before. And this app in conf is the name of the file. And the name of the class is game page. So that's the name of the class there. That's what I was saying before, name of the file, name of the class. Then I just call the class. And then I start calling the elements for, for the class, so each of the elements. And these slides are going to be available at the end of the uh, talk. So I'm going to upload them there, if not at the end, a little bit later after we hang up. And you can see here um, how it's working. And now it's going to fail, obviously, because I, I haven't continued the it's going to click begin and then it's going to fail because I haven't continued the automation here, right? It's just so to show this. So we see how we can automate this game, which imagine automated otherwise, it, it would not be possible, right? You have to do everything manual. So with this case, we can automate it and we can also automate it in a clean way that is maintainable. And all the steps that I say, I repeat, it looks very manual, but it doesn't need to. We can automate all of that. And the slides, again, if you see the code is a little bit small, they will be available in the end. And then we can see, um, you, you can enhance it in your computer and see it a bit bigger. OK, uh, so how can we deal with different resolutions? So this is halfway through the slide. So how can we, how can we handle different resolutions? So if we have, as I said before, we have different templates. And each of the templates will have a resolution um, place there, right? So you can have a list of images that you define it. And then those elements that you've defined it, the images that you define it, or the elements that you define it, you can put them actually in a, in a list. And you just iterate through the list. So this is just going through the list, checking if the element exists. And if it exists, you use it and then you break it because you don't need to check the other elements. So I didn't have an example with multiple resolution, but I thought, OK, why don't I do the same? just to showcase the code, but with all the elements that I have. And this is how it looks. Oh, 
sorry. Okay, so I have my phone connected again. I have my elements here that are defined and I define a list with all these elements. So first the piano, the game up, the begin game, the finger and the uh, screen. And then I go, if the screenshot exists, then I press it and otherwise I, I continue. And then I just iterate it in a, in a while loop, right? So I have a loop to check the elements and a loop to go through all the elements. So let's run this and see how it works. See, you first see the, the app and you see it twice because it found the app. So you click it and then we go again through another loop and because this loop was a little bit slower and the piano is the first one, it's gonna look through everything because it missed the piano, but because I have it in a well loop, then it's gonna go back to the piano, it found it and then it clicks it. Now it's loading, the loop continues with all the elements and happy for us, we have the, again, the because we broke the, the loop, we have the app, and then we have the begin element. It found it, it click it. And now it goes again from the piano, the begin up, now the startup, the begin element. Now we'll see the finger. Now see the finger here, so we click the finger, and there we go. And then it starts again, and the next thing will be to click on that somewhere in the screen, but because it's in a loop, it's slightly too slow and the line already broke. But you see, um, the interesting bit of this is that I could use this very, very easily to create a crawler that will go through all my elements in the screen and try to figure out if there's any element that I can press and I can just go and, and keep looking through all the elements of my screen. So I don't even have to tell them uh, which elements I, I have available. I can just keep them all my elements and go and click whatever you can see. Um, so this is one of the benefits of, of using the, the multiple screenshots, right? But the main, main benefit is for resolution. So when we have different, we not only have an Android, maybe we have also an iOS. Um, so we can, we can use it this way. Also, we kind of have way through. So let me just run it again. And if you want to take a screenshot or something to post on our social media, now is a good time. Let me post. <laughs> Hope you were quick, quick enough. OK, so let's keep going. Uh, how can we do, deal with multiple object finders? So it is not a problem for uh, Android and, and iOS automation uh, for, for IR tests because they always find it by the ID, as we will see in a bit. And also not for the screenshot because the uh, basically the, the finders are always the same. But if you're dealing with things like web where you have different sort of finders, you can find by ID, by name, etc., then you may want to do something like this. This is pseudo code. This doesn't work. Uh, it just goes through all my finders, and if I can find it by that finder, then I click on it. So it's very similar to what we did with the screenshot. If I can find the element by that screenshot, I click on it. But I will also use finders. Uh, but usually the way of dealing with this sort of thing is using a switch, right? And this is the way you kind of use the switch on Python. Python doesn't have the switch per se as uh, maybe Java or C Sharp, uh, but you can use it like this. So you have an element that is ID, a name, and in here we have ele find element by ID and find element by name, and you pass the value that uh, should be passed here. So I, I forgot to add that one. So, Basically, this, this is another way of dealing with multiple IDs. So even if you have multiple ID finders, it's not an excuse for you not to use your page object model and to automate as much as possible. Okay, so now we're gonna see how to deal with multiple platforms. So iOS and Android. And I put here side by side iOS code and Android codes for air test. And it is very interesting because if you see like the first line is exactly the same, the second line is pretty much the same, but it just get the driver for Android and here for iOS. The third line is exactly the same. Then in here, we, ident we ident um, initialize Poco in here with Android, which is this bit here, and in here with iOS, which is this bit here. 
Then this auto set to file, which I don't remember what it is for, but it's always there, so I always put it. And then we get the connect device in here, iOS connect device in here, Android. It's pretty much the same. You have then a URL with a port. You can add a port here. And then you just go Poco and whatever you want to start, dot click. In this case, I'm seeing line two, which is the, the game that I'm showing off today. And you can click. You can clear the app, you can start the app. And here's more information. There's two links. They're not seen very well, but at the end of the slide, I'm giving you more links so you can get the links from there. And so basically what I'm saying here is the code looks pretty much the same. So how can we use or kind of page of your model? How can we do something like that? How can we do a, How can we design this to be able to use the same code without having to record it twice? So first of all, let's see uh, an example of uh, how to handle Android code because what we saw before were for screenshots. So also same sort of um, syntax, but for screenshots. In this case, this is just for Android, right? So in here, it's stuff we can select Android. There's other things like iOS, the Unity, and we can click here just to for it to create these uh, lines automatically. And then we have the DOM and we can click here to see the objects of the DOM. If you go to the DOM directly, it will highlight the objects on the other side. We click in here and we can also record. All right, so we can just uh, click there, do things and it will highlight what everything is and the elements that are there, which is very good. I'm gonna take a sip of water as I'm showing this. So we can click record and do the same. And that means that the code is going to be auto-generated for us. So we can see here that it's clicking with that ideas that are appearing in the um, DOM here. And it's pretty cool, it's fairly good because for Google, we also, we even have um, IDs for the numbers. So we can have here digit, C, uh, digit five, digit six. So for the calculator, everything has their own IDs and it works like a charm. You know, it works really well. Unfortunately, for other applications that doesn't have uh, such a clear DOM for games, um, it is not so straightforward. We will talk in the XR a little bit more about in the XR section about why games have to be done slightly different than with this, uh, but you can always do miss and match. So hopefully it's, um, it's going to get clear as we progress. Okay, so what I talked about before, okay, we have Android, we have iOS, the code is very similar. How can we do that, right? So we can import everything here. So again, this is for getting the, the, the folders and the page on the other folder. I'm importing the uh, Android here and I should import the, uh, the game page here, right? And I'm getting here my Poco, my setup, my, I'm connecting my device. And then in here, I'm just going to call the page and I'm going to pass that Poco. So if this instead of Android was iOS, I'm also passing a Poco. That's all I have to do. And in my page, my page is going to look the same if it's iOS or if it's Android. I'm just going to have this touch game start in which I'm adding the Poco and I'm going to in this case, start the game by calling the ID rather than by clicking the screenshot. And this is how, how it looks. So this is gonna look the same again for Android and iOS. This is gonna be different for Android and iOS, but this is exactly, exactly the same. So I can reduce a lot of code thanks to that. And I don't have to go and create all the screenshots again, or I don't have to go and, and identify all the objects again. So as long as my objects are also, the ID is also the same, this is going to be the same. If my IDs are changing from iOS and Android, then there's nothing I can do really. <laughs> it's, it's different in the in one and then the other. So then the uh, pages have to change. But as long as the IDs are the same, my application name is the same, then I don't have to change anything on my pages, only in the connections. And that's like two lines. Okay, so let's see that working actually. So I have the example here with Android. Exactly the same example as I showed before. So in here I have a uh, touch game start two because 
this is a, I had one already for the screenshot, so this is a, the one that I created, and exactly what is it was on the slides. So instead of doing it by the screenshot, I can keep the same and I can start it with the Android and I pass there the Poco engine that I created. So the Android UI automation Poco. So it is starting and it is starting. And then we we'll, and then we can go home by going through key, uh, key events. So that it is. So even if we have multiple multiple platform, we can still using our enhanced page update model to deal with that. So what about multiple devices? So there is, as I mentioned on the at the beginning of the talk, there is something such as um, chats or some games that collaborate with two devices. They might be two players and they have to do things at different time. And I'm going to show you another game for that even though it's not fully automated. But I, I'll show you a little bit about that game as well. So how can you test that, right? Um, so in here, you can see you can connect the device iOS, you can connect the device Android, and you can set current and switch the current device. So in here, you will go click in one. In here, you will go click in the other one. Uh, in here, I haven't showcased the page of Jet model. Um, and I actually haven't tested with iOS and Android, but I tested with two Android devices. I'll show you the code in a bit. And uh, but the 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 interesting thing here is that you can switch from one to the other, and you can also potentially have it remote. I haven't tested, but this is a URL. So if you have your um, device over Wi-Fi, you should also be able to connect to it. Um, so it, it, this is very good for the local test to check to uh, phones are con collaborated. But if you want to automate this um, in a different way, you probably want to use something like a cloud automation or some cloud solution where you can call your two devices and do the, the, you have some sort of controller and then you control one and that's the other one. So let's see how it works. So the code sometimes a bit confuses. Let's see it with an example. So here's gonna be our code here. And uh, we have the, the two devices. I'm connecting it to my computer. So just using local host for that. And I'm using 200 devices because it's what I could use for this, what I could get for this presentation. So I hope you you um, enjoyed. And I'm recording with my phone and it's not the best screen in the world. It's a little bit cracked. So I put well, the screensaver is cracked. So that white screen is that it has um, stepped it and the, the, the connection. I need to start the game. There's some funny work that it goes it in the middle. And I think it's because I have it like this instead of like that, for the game is like that. And it just click start, and then it started the other game. And again, I don't have the full screenshot of the start, just a, a bit, and then it started as well. And the reason that I did this uh, uh, bit of a uh, start rather than the full button is because my screenshot was having halving in the middle and I think there's some bug. I don't know if it's a bug on the air test or my controllers for ADP, maybe my Android Studio, or maybe my phone themselves, that when they do things connected to the computer and they're like this instead of like that, um, if, if they're in a horizontal, then it breaks and it only shows half of my screen. So that's why I didn't do the full automation for this, but you can see here, them both in the in the same um, kind of um, uh, level, and then they will go inside the level, and they can play together, and we can get something out of that. So I know this is not the best example because it's broken, but you can fix it, and it's fixable. I mean, because it's probably just some drivers that I installed in broadly, or maybe the Android Studio, as I said, and you can you are capable with this to test two devices. And again, this is a little bit ugly because I put everything in my same kind of thing, right? And I'm reducing the code where I could more than, than easily have it in a web and a different uh, page and just reduce this, calling it with a different device and just change current and then calling it and then change current and then calling it with the POCO that um, I need to call it with. So hopefully that's understandable. I think this bit is pretty cool in fairness, to be honest, but um, yeah, it has to be tested a little bit more. 
Okay, so what about XR objects? And this is kind of our, the end of our biggest sections and then the rest is just the smallest. So this is the, the final bits. However, uh, we're 35 minutes in and this is 45 minutes presentation. There's no way I can fully explain about XR in this um, meeting, but I can give you some hints and also Again, if you go to my blog, I'm not doing advertisement for my blog. I don't get money out of it. If you go there, I don't get money for visit or anything. But you can see their past presentations as well. And I've done a presentation about VR and XR, uh, which uh, has a video recorded uh, available. And you can check it. And you can maybe go in a more deeper level there. And also, I have, post some, I have some posts about this as well with more details. So if you need it, they're there. Um, but I'm going to explain it as well here, a little bit how it works. So as I mentioned before, games are a little bit different than other applications. They don't have the DOM available as we saw before in the calculator. And why is that? It's because they usually are created with a different engine, uh, like Cocos or like uh, Unity. In this case, XR is created for Unity. So I'm going to give you the example for Unity. Um, so what, what does it mean? It means that. For me to create automation in Unity, I have to add a folder in Unity and not outside. So uh, it is not possible with this tool at least uh, to create automation directly unless you do the uh, screenshot, but directly uh, touching the DOM, right? Without seeing the code. So it looks a little bit more like a unit test than a, like an end-to-end -end test. But it still, it's very good and helpful, especially when you're writing automation. I can tell you it's super helpful to have it there. So how does it work? So basically, you add the Unity 3D folder that is available to download from AirTest uh, website into your asset folder. So these asset folders are usually on the bottom of Unity. And then in your Unity, you're going to have to have a camera container, a camera follower, and then your camera inside. And uh, this has changed a little bit from when I created a screenshot. So now the next versions don't really work the same, but this is, you can have an idea how it works like this. You need a camera container and a camera follower for many reasons that have to do with the 3D way of the objects moving and how they can like lose a degree of uh, mobility. I don't want to go into details on that. It's also in my blog. If you want, you can go and read more information about it. But that's basically how it works. And then in your game object, in my case, uh, it's going to be, um, you're going to have to have a game object there that is an empty object and that you can just go and add the, uh, the code for, uh, for Poco, right? So that this is set up, basic setup, and it's going to be pretty much the same everywhere. Then you kind of have to import the Unity 3D Unity Poco for the drivers. So instead of Android drivers or iOS driver, as we did before, we do the Unity drivers. And this Unity editor window is so you can do the automation in the editor window of the Unity. Otherwise, you can use your phone for that. So this is how it looks to get the address and then the Unity Poco. So this, again, this is the same everywhere. And this bit here, this is interesting. So this bit here, I did it so uh, I can wait until a movement is done. Why? Because for me to have the movement, um, like a person will do, right? Because if you have a headset, for example, if you have a phone, you don't go directly to an object, right? You go slowly, you move your head, you move your hand. It doesn't go straight away. So you will have some speed there. That means that the movement may have not be finished by the time you may want to do click. Right, so that's why I have this piece of code here. So I have this from the uh, air test code that tell me if a movement has been finished or not, and I just iterate and wait a little bit until it's done. So this is just set up again. This is the important bit here. So um, at the beginning, I can take the object and I can check the attribute in this case texture, and I can save it. And my texture, for example, if, if this was a cube, then this could be like, I don't know if it's red, red or blue, right? So I have a, a cube with a particular texture. I verify that the texture is that one just to make sure that my test case is not going to fail. Then I rotate. There's two ways of rotating. There's a, the, this first line here, which is I just rotate up uh, with a speed of 0, 0 0.5. 
this is another way of rotating and it's just i rotate to look at that object that is called here with a speed of five and this is the camera container and follower that i was telling you before that we need so unfortunately we need to these two objects but you can call them any any way that you want to call them and then i just do a click so it's different for this one it's a click um, on a particular area so just in the middle of the screen in this case uh, for Unity uh, editor window, it looks a little bit different. We'll see it in the video in a bit. And then we can do some assertions. So for example, we can assert that the texture that we get now from that object is different than the texture that we had before. In this example, when I click on the object, it changed color. And then I can assert as well that the texture is um, this new texture here, which is, I think, maybe green or red, I think. So. This, I hope, is clear. I may be going a little bit fast, but I hope it's clear. This is the way you do it. Um, this is the, the video that I have for this. I've reduced this video because uh, the new Unity doesn't have, uh, so this Unity is the one that I have installed in my computer. It's from 2017. It doesn't allow the Android phone that I was being lended for this presentation, so I couldn't make it work with it. I have to download the new Unity and the new Unity um, works slightly different than this one. So the libraries, I have to call different libraries and I have to set up a lot of things. And I didn't have enough time before this presentation to do all of that. Um, but I promise I will update it and put it on the blog. And you can bother me about that anytime you want because I'm making a promise that I will update all of that. Um, and this is how the, the PY, so the Python code, will look like. This is the artist code, but instead of having in the IDE, I have it just uh, as a document. And this is a Visual Studio code. And this is a game that I created for um, a project for VR project, and it's a maze, and you have um, waypoints that you can click and av advance through the maze. So this is what we're going to do. This is a, the setup code that I gave before. And my object that I want to look at is called waypoint seven. So that's the object that I want to look exactly the same code, the same speed and everything. Then I'm going to wait. I'm going to do this loop here to wait until the movement has finished. And then I'm going to uh, go and click in my camera container. So this is why it's slightly different for Unity. Before it was just poco.click, but here I have to give them a poco of the camera, of the element that I want. So I click for the camera. I want the camera to click in a way. So for Android, it looks uh, uh, that can mention before. And then I rotate the object. Um, so basically, I rotate uh, 10 degrees up because I'm going to be looking down and there's going to be a door. And just quickly showing it. So I rotate. I look at my waypoint, I click on my waypoint, I look up, and I should be looking at and clicking at the, the door. See? And I click on the door, and that should be it. And then I can verify things like the door make noises, or it opens, or many other things, right? Again, more on this in separate uh, presentations. So let's just go to the conclusion because. I see Rohit here. I'm pretty sure we're running out of time. <laughs> so let's go quickly through them. So with all of these concepts, what we did is that we increased the maintainability, reliability, and scalability, although it needs a little bit more of automation than what I've shown here to do all of that. But even with the little automation, we already increased all of that. And we can still use our screenshots. Uh, it's easier to reproduce in other platforms. Um, there's some test debris. I haven't handled the test debris in this presentation. I have in another one before, um, but it can be handled. You can go and just remove every object that is not being calling your code from the folder, and that's it. Your uh, screenshots are gone, and everything is clean. It's, it works very well for difficult to test um, applications, such as Game and XR. And any application, uh, it works for any application, and any person can also use it for an easy turnaround rather than uh, writing uh, code. And now you can insert your own application and conclusion. So whatever you feel it has, um, you have learned from these uh, slides, you can put it here as well. I have the links. Again, I'm sharing the slides, so don't bother taking a screenshot of this because it's going to be shared afterwards. 
And that's everything from me. Thank you so much. I don't know if we have much time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Naomi. Um, I, 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 I'm afraid we have questions, time for questions right now, but uh, what Sorry, I will I run out of time. There's so many things I can tell you about this, and this is something I'm passionate about. So, without realizing it, just runs out. Thank you, Naomi, for sharing all your experiences with today. Um, pin me on on Twitter if you can, because I saw someone can join the tables. Pin me on Twitter your questions as well. It'll be fine. I'll reply there. You can find me. I'm I'm findable. I'm approachable. Thank you so much. That's uh, very kind of you. Thank you so much, and thank you, Naomi, again. Thank you all for being here.